Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mina al Arabi. I'm the editor of The National, based in Abu Dhabi, and I am delighted to be chairing this session today, Gulf Economies All In. And we have powerhouses to discuss Gulf Economies on the panel today. Our biggest challenge is going to be time. <laughs> With um, six formidable speakers and only 45 minutes, we'll try to get through as much as we can. Faster economic growth is being seen in the GCC region. Adjustments as we think about the energy transition, diversification, investment opportunities. But it's not all rosy. Like any maturing economies, there are challenges and there are needs for reforms and changes. And that's what we're going to be discussing. I once interviewed the head of the IFC, Mahtar Diop, and he said to me, when I come to the UAE, and really he was referencing the GCC and the UAE, he said it feels like Wall Street meets Silicon Valley because there's money to be made, there is opportunity, and also there's innovation, innovative thinking. We've just had COP28 in the UAE. Qatar hosted the World Cup. Saudi Arabia uh, has ambitious projects from NEOM and also hosting the World Cup soon. Um, Bahrain leading the charge on many uh, different opportunities and the list goes on. So the World Bank estimates 3.6% growth in 2024 and inshallah 3.7% growth in 2025. This is compared to 2.4% globally for 2024. So. In some ways, the region also has to think about what's happening globally and how will those dynamics affect that decision making. So I'm pleased to introduce our panel. Immediately to my left is Minister Khalid Al-Falih, Minister of Investment, Saudi Arabia, uh, Minister Ali Ahmed Al-Kawari, Minister of Finance of Qatar, Hanadi Saleh, Chair of the Board of Directors in Agility, and we have, of course, Sheikh Salman bin Khalifa Al Khalifa, Minister of Finance and National Economy of Bahrain, and Majid Jafar, CEO of Crescent Petroleum and fellow young global leader. We're holding on to the young, Majid and I. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and of course, His Excellency um, Ahmed Jassim Zaabi, Chairman of Abu Dhabi Department of Economic Development. Okay, so, Sheikh Salman, I want to start with you, please. Uh, Get us thinking about how you see the growth outlook in Bahrain and what are the key indicators for those growth patterns, but also what is your biggest challenge? Thank you very much, Mina. And I, I, I did say it in the holding area, so I will say it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm always, um, uh, I, I, I would have to be careful saying anything before Minister Al Falah. He's, uh, uh, he, he's, he's the voice of wisdom of a, uh, and, and, and the statesman that has been an architect of the development agenda that we see in the region today. If it's an honor to be with you, sir, um, and, uh, and, and with everybody else on this esteemed panel. Um, when we talk about growth, if you'll allow me, I mean, I'll just zoom out for a second and look at overall GCC regional growth and the macro trends in it. Today, it's a 2.3 trillion GDP per annum uh, economic uh, unit. Uh, it is moving towards being a $3 trillion per annum GDP uh, economic zone uh, by 2030 and moving towards being a $6 trillion per annum economic zone by 2050. That's the macro trend at conservative numbers. We can look at where global growth will be over the next couple of years, but let's zoom out and look at the long term and look at where that development agenda is. Uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is 50% of that GDP uh, and a big driver of that growth. And that growth across the region is being driven by sound policy, by excellent execution, and by uh, making sure that we are simplifying doing business and having a very rapid decision-making process. Uh, and we're seeing the results in that growth. And when we look at the Kingdom of Bahrain, uh, what we have put in place coming out of COVID in October 2021, we announced the Kingdom's economic recovery plan and it very clearly outlined what we are aiming to achieve. There are six sectors that we are focused on and those six sectors are banking, telecoms and digital services, um, uh, manufacturing, logistics, oil and gas, and tourism. And we're putting everything into those sectors. Today in Bahrain's uh, GDP, 83% of GDP is non-oil, 
and the largest sector in the economy is banking and finance. So we are rapidly making diversification efforts. And what we have found is that whenever you simplify procedures, whenever you go in and get government out of the way and allow the private sector to move at the pace they want to move and give them the enablers that they need, which is mainly a very good jurisdiction in terms of dealing with disputes and high quality infrastructure, things thrive. And that's what we aim to do uh, in Bahrain to continue along this path of growth and ensure that we are a good, solid service center for the wider economic growth in the region that we see led by the larger economies, mainly of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Can I pick up on that, uh, Sheikh Salman, if you allow me? Often when we look at the Gulf, these priorities are similar between different countries. And outsiders will often say they're competing for a very similar pot or competing for similar trends. How do you respond to that? The pie is growing so quickly that you can't be competing. <laughs> You're, what, what, what we're doing is um, we need, we're, the pie currently is, is growing so fast um, uh, that competition is, is, is not even on the table. Everybody is trying to grow their service sectors, grow their participation, grow their GDP, and there's a lot of synergistic benefits. Tourism is a great example. Mm -hmm. When we look at the targets that are being set for tourism across the region, and then we look at the efforts that are being made for joint marketing, for joint packages, for joint um, uh, holidays, uh, it, is, it is a great result, not only just for the GCC, but also for economies around the GCC that participate in that growth. Uh, because then you're talking about even tapping into larger population markets like Southeast Asia, like North Africa, and how they can also drive um, and benefit from that flow of people uh, and, and, and be positive participants uh, in that. So bottom line is the pie is growing so fast um, that at this stage we need more and more partners joining on that journey. Minister Afal, I want to turn to you, please. Uh, Minister of Investment is an incredible portfolio to have as we see the dynamics in uh, Saudi Arabia. The, the, the ambitions are big. Uh, the projects are impressive and have the world's attention. How do you maintain the course, the vision, um, when there are developments, be it uh, uh, regional instability, be it changes in the global outlook, uh, what's that steadfast vision? But also importantly, uh, are there reforms that Saudi Arabia still needs to make and what are they? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mina. Thanks to the WEF and thanks to Sheikh Salman for uh, his humility and kind compliment. Uh, and I fully agree with everything he said in terms of the macro, the sizing, the complementarity that he alluded to uh, between uh, the GCC uh, countries. We are a common market that has been around for over uh, 20 years. And this common market, this uh, road to integration between the GCC country uh, is, uh, is extremely necessary and it has served us extremely well. Uh, our combined GDP has increased by multiple times. Trade, external trade with the outer world has increased a lot more than it would have if we had remained uh, independent of, uh, of this integration. And our inter-regional trade has also multiplied in the last 20 years and is going to take off in, in the non-oil sector, of course, uh, as, we, uh, as we go forward. Uh, I think as we talk about the non-oil economy consistently across the region, this is where the growth is going to be. This is where the individual country strategies are that are complementing each other and that are serving this interdependence and integration between uh, GCC country. Uh, Saudi Arabia is very committed to working with our GCC partners represented. Uh, on the panel and our private sector companies uh, are also fully embedded in each and every nation of the GCC as we create value to each other and bring value chains uh, across the region in a very globally robust uh, way. I think as we look at global trends, there is of course the energy transition uh, and the kingdom strategy and I believe the same goes for uh, the other GCC countries. We're intent, and we will succeed, inshallah, of remaining 
the region that provides energy solutions, energy reliability, energy affordability uh, to the rest of the world, but it's going to transition more to a decarbonized, uh, environmentally sustainable mix of energy that will have oil and gas continuing for a long, long time, but of course will bring the green, blue, and, and uh, other forms uh, of energy that's emerging. And that is a huge growth potential for the kingdom, but I believe it's going to be done at a regional level. And we've seen Saudi companies invest heavily in the Emirates, in Bahrain, in Kuwait, uh, and in Oman as we build this, uh, this uh, sector of, uh, of, of renewable energy uh, and hydrogen. The other trend, of course, is digital transition with everything from cloud computing, AI recently, and, uh, and all of the capabilities that digitalization brings. And I think the region is going to continue to lead in this area. I think connectivity, uh, speed, uh, and, and what have you is all uh, a big enablers for industries, for logistics, for travel and tourism to come to the kingdom and, take, and to the region and take advantage of this digital platform that is complementing. Of course, we're, we're endowed in the region in addition to what I mentioned with a, with, with a fantastic location. Uh, I think as trade becomes re-engineered uh, globally from where it has been to, the, to build the resilience, the Middle East is the place where people are looking at because we're close to Europe, we're right next door to uh, Africa and of course we're uh, in Western uh, Asia and we have the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, the ports, the airports, we have great companies like Agility, we have Hanadi with us, that are also allowing global value chains to be uh, re-engineered with, with the Middle East uh, right at the core. Uh, and last but not, la uh, not least is the global trends around demographics, aging populations. Uh, and, and uh, declining interest in blue collar jobs in, uh, in some region. Uh, and, and one thing uh, Sheikh Salman did mention is we have uh, 60 million highly uh, educated, young, driven uh, people that love to work, love to innovate, love to invest uh, in startups and they're working together amongst themselves but they're working with the rest of uh, the world. Uh, capital is a big connector to everything I said, and I think that everybody knows that the region is, is long on capital, and the capital we have, linking it with global capital, whether it's in public markets and private markets and uh, in different instruments, uh, allows us to bring investments at scale not seen anywhere else uh, today. And, and I think the most important thing the most important thing in a turbulent world today is political stability, long-sighted vision, consistency uh, in those policies and also in the regulations below them. And the world today is longing for a combination of that economic stability, political leadership and stability, infrastructure, physical and digital, capital, uh, and a private sector uh, in the region that we're very proud of. The, the, Companies in Saudi Arabia and the rest of the GCC have risen to become global leader. They're no longer a national and regional leader. And they're a big magnet to bring investment. Lastly, the GCC is attracting FDI into the GCC at more than twice the average rate around the world when you compare it, when you normalize it for GDP. And I believe we're at an inflection point where that's going to increase. And we've seen it in Saudi Arabia, and I believe my colleagues will speak about it. And FDI is not just about capital. I mentioned we're long on capital, but it brings know-how, it brings access to market, uh, and it brings global integration for us. Because that's one of the big changes, just on your last point, one of the big changes we've seen is that uh, for the countries of the GCC now, it's not just about what is the transaction, what is the dollar sum that's uh, coming out of a deal, but it's really the joint investment, the expertise, the learnings. Tell me how kind of the investment strategy as Minister of Investment has changed in, in maybe perhaps in a decade. I think a decade ago, we wouldn't be having a conversation like this. I, I think w you know, what we do in Saudi Arabia uh, is, is we look at every sector of the economy and we have a specific target for every sector. 
What, are, what is the productivity of that sector going to be in 10 years, in 15 years? And what do we need in terms of capability? Not just assets, human talent, IP, uh, access to markets. And based on, that, based on that, we find the right partners, <coughs> we find the right investment scheme with the right long-term uh, uh, line of sight, uh, and we invest for those long-term journey. If the private sector can do it on its own, our role as a government is to provide the ecosystem, to provide the regulation, to provide the financial framework so that they could access financial markets. If the private sector doesn't yet have the appetite for it, then government entities like sovereign wealth funds will step in to catalyze those sectors that there is hesitancy from the Saudi private sector. They will co-invest with international partners or do it on, uh, on our own and then gradually exit and turn it to the private sector fully. Uh, Minister Akwar, if I can pick up on that point of the sovereign wealth funds and their role and how you balance trying to grow and foster a strong private sector while at the same time having the, the strength of the government doing its investing in its projects. Thank you, Mina. First of all, I mean, uh, thank you for hosting me in this session. And I'm happy to be with my colleagues here, you know, uh, in this session. It's, it's a very important subject. Gulf economies, I think it's a very important subject. And I will not, you know, repeat, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, I would like to follow in what uh, Sheikh Salman uh, mentioned and also His Excellency Al Falah, you know, what they mentioned about the importance of the GCC and, you know, the role the GCC is playing today in the, in the world economies in many ways, you know, whether in the energy supplies, whether, you know, in the, in the growth, in the economies and, and the opportunities, you know, of providing yet also the capital, as you mentioned, and this leads us to your question. And about the sovereign wealth funds and uh, the role of sovereign uh, sovereign wealth fund, you know, is one of the example of the strength of the GCC countries. You know, uh, which is I mean, it's, it's one of the champions because we have so many national champions. You know, in the GCC, uh, I am sitting next to to my friend. You know. Uh, from agility and you know she, I mean this is one of the champions we have in the logistics we have many other champions in aviation but sovereign wealth funds is 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 one, is one of them and as you know we have uh, powerhouses in the in the GCC when it comes to sovereign wealth funds and the way we understand it you know I mean sovereign wealth funds they play a very significant role for the future financial uh, sustainability of, of 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 the generations to come you know for the future generations of the GCC and this is mainly the big role you know for all the sovereign wealth fund, but yet they play a very important role in terms of like national economies, where they also because they, because of the capital availability and the know-how. I mean, they are able to invest and co-invest, you know, with the private sector in many important <coughs> sectors, and sometimes even to drive investment in sectors sometimes not attractive for many private sectors. So very important, and we have seen this. Uh, to give an example of in Saudi Bef, you know, they've been very active in the local investments and driving growth and driving, you know, uh, realizing, uh, reali realization of the vision, you know, 2030. So it's very important, I think, for the sovereign wealth to drive, it, and the way they can do it through venture capitals, you know, sub uh, supporting startups, as well as going to sectors that are sometimes not attractive and joining hands with the private sectors and adding capitals and sometimes seed funding, you know, these uh, investments. So this is a very important role, and I think we should not, while they play the big role in the future, the, what, what we call it, the future generation fund, you know, I mean, and to act like, you know, this is a source for, you know, as, as part of the diversification for, for the economy, yet it's very important they have to really support the local economies, giving the position they are in, the know-how and the capital, as I mentioned. So this, these are really, really very, very important. And I, I must say also, I mean, speaking about this, I think, Speaking about Qatar, you know, uh, last week we have launched our national development strategy, the third national development strategy. As you know, I mean, uh, in 2008, we put the Qatar Vision 2030, and, and I'm happy that to see, and this is one of the, I think, the importance why the GCC is so successful, because we have a long-term view in, in, in Saudi 2030, uh, I know UAE 2031, and also Bahrain, you know, uh, 2035. 2030. 2030 also. So we have this long view, you know, and Kuwait, the same thing, and Oman as well. You know, so we have this long view, and it's very important that we work toward this long-term vision and to become more disciplined in executing, you know, the strategy. So NDS3, because NDS1, 
our intention was to build a very strong <coughs> champions, local champions for the brand building and the business development, which we have done, you know, in the aviation side, in the finance, in the in the, in the telecom, in, in many other sectors, you know, in the airlines. And then we moved into build state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure. We have spent more than $200 billion infrastructure, you know, which is our second state, which helped us to host the best World Cup ever, you know, in Qatar 2022. So, and that now we are really, we have an excellent, you know, foundation where we can build our NDS3, which is economic growth, economic diversification, private sector enabling, and to move away from government-led economy to private sector-led economy. We believe always, you know, the private sector is very important for the future. So if we are talking diversification, growth, you know, government, yes, you can do it. You have the capital, you have the guts, but, you know, I mean, the private sector is the most important. And they are very important even to talk about demographics, about, you know, creating jobs, you know, for the future. Because, and, and to become more efficient and more effective and to run, you know, the businesses better, yet, to help the government and take some of the burdens in the government from the government. So uh, this is our strategy, and, and, and we, as I said, we have launched it, and we look forward. You know, also we are having a session later on about Qatar strategy. So, but the same thing as I say, as we speak about our position, I see the same thing. You know, for all the GC countries, and this is, I think, the vision and and the discipline have been shown. You know, in terms of like executing the plans is very important. And yet, I should not forget. You know, the role of the. Uh, you know, Gulf Cooperation Council. I'm glad that His Excellency uh, Justin Dewey is with us here. He's the Secretary General for uh, GCC. And there are so many initiatives that have been taken today by the GCC, whether the Economic Union, the Custom Unions, uh, you know, uh, free trade agreements, and congratulations in recent agreement, I mean, signature of uh, South Korea, Korea of, uh, FTA, and also uh, uh, recently also the, the Pakistan. You know, FTAs, and, and I know, I know more. Are, they are coming because of the, you know, advanced negotiation, advanced in, in, in advanced negotiations. You know, and so these these things are very important. This, you know, building this, you know, uh, cohesiveness and and connectivity between the GCC and sharing information. And yet, and I agree with the Sheikh Salman. The pie is growing, so it's it's. I think, and I don't think we 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 compete. We complement each other. Correct. And, and I think this is. Uh, what I Can see. we see that complementarity go to the next <coughs> level soon? Do we see economic union, currency? Where are we on that? How do you see it? Absolutely. I, th I think it makes sense. You know, this is from my opinion. It makes sense. We, I mean, we have so many things in common, you know. We share the same economic structure, the same, you know, the same, you know, uh, families, the same, you know, origins, language, everything. You know, I think there are some, and, and you know, I, I think we are in a position where we can really make a very strong economic power, you know, moving forward, you know, as a GCC. And we have all the tools. Of course, I mean, sometimes, you know, things take longer than it should, but, you know, at the end of the day, the intentions are there. And, and, and the willingness is there, and this is the most important things. And we're, <laughs> we're happy that Qatar will be hosting the GCC meetings, you know, for 2024. And, let's, and I'm hoping that we'll make a breakthrough, inshallah, through uh, this year. Inshallah, <laughs> inshallah. Um, Mr. Saleh, I want to bring you into the conversation because Minister Kawai was just speaking about private sector. We've heard from the ministers a real sense that the private sector is imperative um, growing the private sector, enabling it in order to see these visions come through. Um, private sector has different dynamics. So I want to ask you what, what your greatest challenge as Agility, again, based in Kuwait, but really working throughout the region and the world, not just the region, um, how you see the private sector's challenges in the GCC? What do you need? I think, th I th I think from our perspective in the private se sector, especially looking at Agility and the investments we've done, in, you know, especially in the GCC, is that the reform agendas that they have in place is really moving us in the right direction, the right direction in terms of capital flow, in terms of policy, reform, looking at the free movement of people and goods. So if I take a slice of logistics and transportation and all the investments that have taken place here, at Agility we launched the Emerging Market Index, which ranks 51 countries from the emerging markets. And you have the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE ranking from the top 10 in terms of attractiveness to invest for the private sector. You look at the, how they're earmarking investments in Saudi Arabia, over $130 billion. You have UAE companies earmarking $5 billion for strategic transport and logistics assets. From our perspective, this is all moving in the right direction. 
and that makes us excited. So from Agility's perspective, what we do is we double down in the region. We're earmarking $130 million of investments in 2PL logistics parts in Saudi Arabia. We're doing the same in Kuwait. We're earmarking the development of a million square meters of land. At the same time, we have a partnership with GWC. We're the second largest shareholder in GWC, a Gulf Air housing company, an investment in logistics <coughs> in Qatar. And the same thing with UAE. It's home to our digital logistics uh, freight platforms. So from our perspective, all these reform agendas with the investments and the new policy act sort of as a guiding light to make us make these markets more attractive and engage the private sector more actively. So the assumption that some people might have that the public sector might be crowding out or the government crowds out the private sector in certain areas is a wrong assumption? I think it goes hand in hand. I'd argue that it crowds in because if you look at the the sort of the timing of the development when these reform agendas have come into play. We've worked hand in hand with the government, you know, in the development of lands and, pro you know, and various different areas. For example, we develop land, developing crafts areas in order to promote SMEs and en enabling them within different countries. So I think it goes hand in hand. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zabi, I want to turn to you. Now, you have an interesting uh, portfolio with the um, Department of Economic Development in Abu Dhabi. Um, and, and all we're discussing here is kind of, the, again, macro trends, the big changes, digitization, energy transition, um, attraction, attraction not only of capital, but of talent. Um, so from your vantage point in Abu Dhabi, how do you see the complementarity across the, the Gulf, but also what are your priorities at the moment? Well, I think for the UAE, we're, we've, we've been working hard to, uh, to ensure that we're a hub for business, a hub for entrepreneurs, and a hub for new economies in the future. Now, having said that, I think diversification kicks in very fast given the transition that is happening across the world. Uh, the UAE has a transition like any other country, especially predominantly you know, uh, oil has played a big role in the UAE and we, has to, we have to transition. Now, identifying the clusters that we're gonna be working on is very important and very pivotal. So identification of clusters and understanding which clusters that we're gonna be in, what are the, the right to play within those clusters and then what is the right to win within those uh, clusters is important. So we've identified different clusters and we've identified where exactly we want to, want to win in them. Having said that, also we need to ensure that you know we have to deregulate and re-regulate uh, further. Uh, it's important that uh, there is a clear uh, public-private partnership that is being built, especially when economies are being grown across the GCC countries. Uh, now, understanding that is very important, and understanding where the private sector is going to play and where the public sector is going to play. We view it as the public sector is going to be an anchor when it comes to economic value add, not financial value add. So. Having the financial value add to the private sector is very important, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the public sector when it comes to economic value add. So understanding who is the anchor and who's going to do what in that cluster and in every single area of business is very important. A number, another thing is ensuring that the talent is attracted within, within the, the region or the UAE is very important. So talent attraction is going to be there. Technology not only as a sector but all, also as a provider to increase productivity within the GCC and the UAE is very important. So in the UAE, we're focusing on increasing the productivity as much as, as, much as we can. Probably we need to double the productivity if we want to be competing, if we wanted to open up and have access to markets across the world, then we have to increase that productivity because competition is not gonna be only within a region, it's gonna be global. So hence, in, in improving technologies within Education is going to play a big role, but not as in normal the education that we know it, but actually education, the future of education is going to be, play a big role. Another thing is life sciences is also something that we'll be focusing on. Uh, and creating a, 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 a haven where, where, you know, ensuring that people can come to, uh, to the UAE or the GCC where they can work, live, uh, uh, have fun, enjoy their life, and build a family within Within, within the UAE is very important to us. Hence, tolerance is very important within that. So all in all, this is where we're at uh, currently. Can I ask you about uh, emerging uh, industries, emerging technologies? 
Um, Abu Dhabi is, and the UAE is really standing out in terms of thinking about fintech. What's the risk appetite for some of these emerging um, industries, but also technology, especially when we think about fintech and crypto? Well, uh, there is a misconception about uh, the risks. Risks is in every single sector that you go into. Uh, so from the side of the government is understanding which regulations that you're going to put there. And it's important that you create a risk-based regulator. Hence, the government takes a risk or the regulator takes a risk and the investor takes a risk. Putting the right regulations is going gonna, is gonna to be very important in here. So we've done that uh, and, we've, and we've constantly and, uh, and continuously improved the regulations to actually align with, uh, with best practices and ensuring that that risk is mitigated throughout. So understanding the industry and, and understanding where we're going. FinTech is going to play a big role, but more than that, unlocking private markets is going to be a bigger role. So equities market is fine, it's unlocked, it's unlocked, it's heavily regulated. However, private markets is where technology with blockchain and going forward is going to be the bigger play now. We've got trillions and trillions of dollars sitting in private markets that are waiting to be unlocked. So putting regulations to unlock those uh, l private markets is going to be the next big thing, and I think that's where I think, uh, you know, for the GCC, we can tap into that, and I think it's, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to unlock a lot of uh, economic value add to all the GCC countries. And Mr. Jaffa, I want to turn to you. We've spoken about diversification, um, the energy transition, hugely important. You know, uh, Crescent is, is hugely important for energy, but also when you're thinking about from the private sector, what those opportunities are, but what are also your challenges? Uh, thank you. So first of all, stepping back, I think we're all hearing that the region is, mashallah, going through a golden age of uh, growth and, and, and progress. But I think it's important to recognize that's not something that's happened suddenly. Yes, we've had higher energy prices recently, but we're really now enjoying the fruits of visionary leadership and decades of stability. And those are the two key elements that, that the private sector needs, that the economy needs uh, anywhere. I think if we step back and out, hearing things like the, the government should be enabling the private sector, hearing things like governments trying to attract talent from around the world. We're not, we're not hearing those things from many other parts of the world today, including Europe, including developed countries. The narrative has, has often gone against uh, those. So I think we, we need to recognize how special uh, that is. Obviously, there are some good macro factors at play. We've got inflation coming down, in, uh, interest rates coming down, a young and more educated uh, population, the talent attraction uh, of expats, and the energy prices that have been stable. I mean, relatively high, but also stable. But just to touch on three things which I think have been fundamental. One is the investment flows. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're in the tens of billions of dollars annually, but I think importantly, and for the first time, we're seeing in and out, flows in and out. So sovereign wealth funds now in the region have grown 70% in the last five years and are now $4 trillion, which is a third of the world's sovereign wealth funds. And they're making strategic investments around uh, the world, which is not only part of economic diversification, income diversification, but is adding to the political clout uh, of, of the region. But then similar amounts of tens of billion dollars of FDI coming in. So it's reached 5% of GDP now, which is the highest uh, of any region. Secondly, on energy, and again, I'm in the presence of our, our teacher, uh, Minister Al-Faleh, in that sector, I think you know, the GCC has half the world's oil reserves, roughly speaking, a very large percentage of the world's gas reserves, and thanks to Qatar and, and other reserves, and those are still actually largely undeveloped at a time when demand is going up, and we're seeing Europe wanting more LNG, uh, prices in Asia, and so on. And then what was touched upon with the energy transition, the energy sources of the future, whether it's you know, new forms, green hydrogen, uh, solar, the lower cost solar power in the world, these are being proven up in our region because of the ability to invest and because of the availability of those uh, energy sources. And finally, on the... Um, the infrastructure, and, and we could, could have a whole session just on that, but there have been major investments in both the digital and the physical 
uh, in infrastructure across the region, including connecting uh, uh, the region uh, together. So I think it's, it's positive. What are, what are challenges? Obviously, there are risks. Could there be an energy shock worldwide? That's the risk for the whole uh, global economy that's being discussed here in, in, in Davos. We saw it last year. It seems less likely the, this year. Could there be, God forbid, escalation uh, conflict-wise in the Middle East? Uh, there are, of course, risks, but at the moment, the stars are uh, aligned. And even in the case of tourism, where some other parts of the region have been affected, uh, we haven't seen that in the NGC, and, and tourism has been uh, sustained. Uh, part of the challenge of having little time, of course, we're speaking about the Gulf region. It sits in a volatile uh, environment at the moment, devastating war, of course, in Gaza, but also the concerns about the Red Sea and beyond. Uh, there are too many protracted conflicts to talk about. We haven't spent time on this panel speaking about it because we wanted to actually take the time to talk about what is happening in the Gulf and also the opportunities that are there. We have time for questions. Please indicate to me if you'd like to ask a question and if you can stand as you ask your question so that you can be seen. So gentlemen here, and if you could kindly identify yourself. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Michael Seuss from Erlikon, Switzerland. One question to the, whole, to the whole group here is how you maintain your workforce or how you create your workforce. But we see actually in U.S. we are short on workforce in U.S. We are short on workforce in Britain. We are short on workforce in Germany despite the migration because that's the wrong migration. So will you generate in the GCC countries the capable workforce you need for the growth out of your population? Or will that be a, a, a war for talent of, of migration? Mm -hmm. In Switzerland here, we have almost 30% non-Swiss people working here. Swiss has never given up its identity. I'm a Swiss migrant. I'm from Bavaria. It's the southern part of Germany. So mm -hmm. how you will handle that? Because this will be decisive besides the capital and all the other stuff. If you yes. don't have a capital workforce, you will not make it. OK. If I, if I may. Um, Thank, thank you for that question, and that's, that's a challenge globally. Uh, and uh, we are very lucky to be in a region where uh, we have a growing population and we have a young population, uh, and have uh, been able to uh, provide them in the GCC with a high level of education and, more recently, a high level of digi digitization. Uh, and, and therefore, the first problem that you have in any country is if the population is declining. Then you have nothing to work with. Then the next issue you have is you have areas of the world where you have rising populations and young populations, but there is not enough education infrastructure to bring them in to be economically additive, and so they end up being a burden on the state. The sweet spot that we're seeing in the GCC is that we have young populations, we have a high growth rate, and there is a very high quality education system that's, ab that's, that's able to transform them to being economically additive. And today, I'll give the, 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 the example of the Kingdom of Bahrain. Um, one of the main attractions when, when, when companies are coming and looking at FDI is they say, oh, we have the ability to hire Bahrainis. And we have the ability to also have an open market where we're able to bring in labor. Uh, and, and So that combination of the fact that one of the attractions is the labor force, the challenge is to ensure that you have skills sustainability. And today, for example, with AI coming in, that you embrace the technology and make it a center where people work with it and become experts in it. Or you very quickly get left behind. And that's one of the challenges that we need to ensure skills sustainability is there across the board. Uh, and just to add to that, I mean, I think the GCC has a hidden untapped or in the process of being tapped potential, and that's a female workforce. So if you look over the years, you have countries like Kuwait, uh, the UAE, and Bahrain, where women's participation is grown to over 50% in the workforce. You have KSA, which has grown over the past few years to 47% of the workforce, and, but the specifically interesting part about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it's largely taking place in the private sector. So there is definitely a hidden untapped potential, which I think is yet to flourish. Minister, yeah, I would add to the excellent uh, comments that have been made is that the region has also evolved a little bit from where the government had the primary responsibility of training 
uh, and the private sector complained that there is a mismatch between skills, attitudes, and, and the jobs they require. And this has been a problem we have to acknowledge. Correct. To, to a public-private partnership where the government participates and providing some of the vocational training, some of the education infrastructure, the private sector provides the skills, competencies, uh, productivity that they demand from the incoming workforce, and the two work together. And the government provides a lot of funding to reduce the cost of uh, training. Uh, but I think something that has been said repeatedly is that the Gulf has the perfect model, in my opinion, and I have worked around the world, where you're blending to the maximum the capabilities of your population, and they are not insignificant, and topping it off with the best that you can get globally and providing the, 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 the living standards, the quality of life, the attractiveness, where you see it from around the world, people want to move to the Gulf. They want to raise families, they want to skill up in, in the uh, indices, indices of the future that are growing at scale in, uh, in the region, and we're seeing it certainly in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Mr. Kowari yeah. wanted to come Thank in. Thank you. I think it just, I mean, actually to some, I, mean, I would like to add to what His Excellency Sheikh Salman and Excellency al Fala. You know, I mean, it's, it's, the, the, the answer is very simple. I mean, we are investing in education, we're investing in, on, on the development of the human capital in the countries, and it's a huge, it's, it's one of the pillars of our visions and strategies, and it's coming up very strongly now, we see the results. Yet, also what His Excellency Al Falah mentioned about that we are open to talents, and and the GCC has been a home for many, you know, uh, international expertise as well, you know, from all the continents. So we have the access. We, in term, we are very open in, ter in terms of attracting capital. So even human capital, even if we don't have enough in terms of like you know population, you know, although we are growing at a good a good rate, but still we are open, and we have certain regulations and policies, our migration policies, have been very much open in terms of welcoming, you know, uh, talent with their families, and also to have to build generations, you know, in the, in the region. So we are open both ways, developing our own, you know, uh, nationals, in the same time, open to, you know, talents everywhere in the world. Mr. Jaffrey wanted to... No, just to quickly add to that, uh, and totally endorse all that was said about the, on the talent, but also in terms of the capital investment. So the, the region last year in 2023 awarded contracts of $205 billion. But more than ever before, we're seeing that those contracts are tied with local content and talent development, which was different from decades ago. Wow. It's really not just about building something, but actually about empowering, enabling, enhancing the local private sector and developing the talent uh, at the same time. So that blending of the capital uh, investment with the talent development is, I think, uh, what's so special. Okay, so we're nearly out of time, but I'm going to ask each of you, please, in one word or one sentence, tell me from your vantage point as we're beginning 2024 in a global setting where we're expecting elections, we still have high inflation rates and not coming down as quick as people want, interest rates at all time high globally. Um, what one thing are you watching, are you looking out for that can impact your work? Minister Fadah, I start with you. Well, the truth is we're, <laughs> we've got a wide aperture. We're watching everything and opportunistically jumping on, on those uh, emerging opportunity, but also in a very agile way, reacting to any threats or uh, uh, challenges. I think the talk of everywhere, not just WEF is AI and we're going to invest and double down on our digitalization strategy. Uh, I think interest rates will be, uh, will be a challenge and I think we have to make sure investors have means to offset the, those through access to, uh, to, to innovative uh, financing tools to make sure that we don't slow down as interest rates persist at these levels. Minister Kawai. Yes. I mean, I think the economic parameters will be will be good, will look good, you know, in 2024, in terms of like inflation coming to normal ranges, in terms of interest rates start, we start, we should start, you know, the Fed, you know, reducing, you know, based on their, on their you know, inflation targets. Uh, we should see, you know, I mean, a very stable oil prices. I think the, the supply demand, you know, is, is, is uh, very sufficient. 
So everything should look in a good shape. Of course, I mean, the, I, mean think, I think the biggest challenge for, for the area is the geopolitics. And, uh, you know, we have to be careful about that point. I mean, we have the war in Gaza, you know, is, is, is one thing. And this is something, as you know, it's completely inhuman. And, you know, what's, ha what's happening in Gaza. And, 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 and this is going to kind of affect, of course, you know, also the, in the regional stability is, is very important. So I think that's the biggest challenge. But from economical, from, you know, uh, from business parameters, I think things look in good perspectives. So from our perspective, I mean, we've, we see this region as growing, growing quite healthily, and we earmarked hundreds of millions of dollars of investment over the next few years. So we're keeping our, our eye on the execution, and also opportunistically, you know, we think this region is set, you know, we're doubling down on it. So that's one thing we think is very important. And then obviously, the geopolitics of the region gets us a little nervous. Geopolitics aside, I'm not going to make any geopolitical comments, I'll keep that aside. Um, AI and the adoption of AI and how it will, um, it's, it's transformative and the way it manifests itself in different industries will be the biggest transformation since the Industrial Revolution, so that's what we're watching. So I would endorse uh, the points made by my esteemed colleagues and, and on AI also the rate of its adoption in different sectors in our region. And then to add one new point, I think uh, what happens with the Chinese economy. Chinese is an import, China is an important trading partner of our region across many areas, including with energy. And really what is happening with that economy, I think, has global ramifications and for our region as well. Technology. I think that's it, whether it's uh, AI or you know, quantum computing or any other kinds of technology, probably those trends are going to play a big role and the gradations of that and how we're going to get there. So I think uh, technology is going to be the biggest trend uh, going forward to think of. So with that, our eyes on technology, adoption of AI, watching, of course, the macro trends regionally, globally, demographics, the opportunity of young people and the people of our region, investment opportunities, but of course, keeping our eye on geopolitics. Uh, these are difficult times uh, in our region. Inshallah, we are able to have a more optimistic outlook politically, but at least on the economy and at least in the GCC, uh, as we say in Arabic, uh, it is looking uh, promising and it's exciting, but also not to be blind to the challenges that exist. There is complementarity in the GCC and the strength and the unity we see here between the private sector, the public sector and the different countries gives us hope, which is always important. Vision, long-term vision, stability, but always hope. Thank you so much for joining us. Please. Thank you.